Hello and welcome to Time for God as we think about John the Baptist and what he has to say about Jesus as we travel through Advent. A man went into the confessional. Confessor, I have stolen a fat goose from a back garden. Priest, that is very wrong. Confessor, would you like to accept it, Father? Priest, certainly not. Return it to the person you stole it from. Confessor, but I have offered it to him, and he won't have it. Priest, in that case, I suppose you may keep it yourself. Confessor, thank you, Father. Later that day, the priest arrived home to find that one of his geese had been stolen from his back garden. Sometimes you have to listen very carefully to what people are saying to really understand what they mean. Even at the time, people were confused about who John the Baptist is. So confused that the powers that be in Jerusalem send important people, priests and Levites, out into the countryside to find out. And they fire away with their questions. Are you this? Are you that? It sounds a bit like the Today programme on Radio 4. But such rapid questions do not always reveal worthwhile answers. Sometimes we have to pay attention to the whole picture and listen very carefully. The person may not be able to explain themselves within the scope of our questions. This is the problem today. The people asking John the Baptist who he is don't understand the truth that he's trying to tell them. They want a nice easy label to stick on him, something they can dismiss and then get on with something else but he refuses to fit into any of their neat categories. To the extent he answers no to all of their questions. Are you the Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. But negative answers need not be, well, negative. They can tell us a lot, gradually bring us around to what we need to know. A bit like the old 20 questions, if you remember. It seems that these religious inspectors are asking more about John's ancestry and genealogy than what he is actually doing. In fact, he is asked variations on the same question three times, and three times he responds in the negative. And there is clearly more to John than just the yes-no game, and he sees that there is a subtext going on. It is tempting to assume that the religious people are out to discredit John the Baptist. But just for a moment, let's imagine that they've come out of curiosity, thinking that finally the Messiah might actually have appeared. But John rejects every single label they try to pin on him. And so we are told not very much about who John is, but a lot about who he is not. From such a perspective, there may be sadness in John saying that he is not the one they are looking for. Labels can be very limiting. Are you clever like your sister? Are you funny like your dad? Don't you look like your mum? These sorts of questions, they're really statements, can get very frustrating. I remember visiting a new baby in hospital and the whole family was saying, she looks like him, she looks like her. I could see the mother getting frustrated. So I said gently, she looks like herself. And you might remember a boy called Harry Potter. He has always been told he looks like his dad, that he has his mother's eyes, that he should be good at Quidditch because his dad was. But Harry never knew his parents, and so he doesn't know how to be like them. He has to work out for himself who he is, and work out for himself what choices to make. This is a big and difficult thing to do. It takes Harry seven very big books to do the job. But he gets there eventually, and spoiler alert, good wins in the end. And actually, we all have something similar to do. We all have to think about who we are, what is important in our lives, what we are looking for, who we are like, and what is our life's work. We aren't anyone else. Each one of us is unique. And John the Baptist's work, his identity, is to make way for Jesus, to prepare people for the Messiah. The leaders from the temple struggle with this, growing increasingly desperate and not wanting to return to Jerusalem with only a negative answer. 
So finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied to the word in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. John finally gives a positive statement about his identity, but he still leaves them with an intriguing and cryptic answer. Among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. The information they and we have gleaned from John amounts to this. I am not the one, he is to come, and he is already among you, but you don't know him. This might not sound like much, but it is entirely consistent with the Jewish tradition that the Messiah would be could be anyone. Therefore the logic goes, be careful. It could be the person standing next to you. So treat that person as if he or she were the Messiah. John is often thought of as a humble man, giving way to the greater one who is to follow. Well, yes and no. Read the passage carefully and you will see that he is actually very confident. He knows exactly what he is doing and who he is. And he knows who he is not. I am not the Messiah, he says. But he knows his place in God's story. He knows that he is the first actor on the stage, the narrator, the one who sets the scene at the start of the New Testament. He is the man who does the previously in the Bible speech and lets us know what is to come. And John is even more excited than the crowd are as he looks around searching for the face he knows must be there. He understands his work as a herald and does not mind that his work will be eclipsed by the light that is to follow. And notice how he has no hesitation in applying words of scripture to himself. He knows that the prophets long ago foretold his coming and longed to see what he is about to see. John is both humble, he knows his role in God's story, and confident. He gets on and does it. After all, any part in God's great story is worth having and is vital and wonderful. Perhaps we can think of John as the page between the Old and New Testaments. He is the link. He is the last prophet and the first messenger. This is why he is so important. And through him, all the prophets of old pour out their excitement at what is happening at last. We hear some of the old prophets in the readings in our carol services, which are coming up, starting with the Time for God Christmas Helping this evening. God is coming, they say. God with us, Emmanuel. No wonder John gets excited. And we can get excited as well. O oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Our story of John the Baptist takes place when both he and Jesus are grown men, of course. Soon we will look back to the birth. But the good news of Christmas is not a cosy scene of snow and reindeer and men in red coats, however much fun that can be. The good, the good news is that at last, the earth is to see the full nature and glory of God. The good news is that finally, we see what God is really like in a feeding trough in a stable. And God calls us to let people know. We need to share the good news of Christmas, speaking out the truth while being neither arrogant nor falsely humble. It is not easy doing all we can to ensure that our true distinctive voice is heard. But then we can tell the story of who we are and our part in the big story. And once we have found our voice, it becomes much easier to listen to the cries of others. It means we can tear off those labels, the ones we put on ourselves and the ones they put on us, and respect each other and get more confident in our faith as we listen more deeply and help each other more and more. And we can try to treat everyone we meet as though they were the Messiah to see them in the light of Christ, as God might see them, each and every one with their unique and uniquely important role to play in the story of God. Amen.